not going to put any music to this video at all. Doesn't need any. The high desert has its own voice. It is almost completely silent where I am. You're not going to hear voices. Seldom will you hear a car, a truck, or a motorcycle. They're rare out here. I am deep in the west desert of the great state of Utah, all alone this time, and you are watching the Nut and Fancy Project. I'm not really a channel about guns, I'm not a channel about knives, I'm not a channel about gear of any sort. I am a channel about freedom and life. And along the way, I'll review things that help you enjoy those things. To make adventures, to complete your systems, Maybe it's a defensive system. In this case, it's an adventure system. And that's what this video is about. I will be shocked, by the way, if anybody comes up this road. That's how remote I am. I think it's so remote out here that it is common courtesy. If you pass anyone who is parked, you ask them if they're okay. <laughs> Do you need help, sir? You out of gas? Are you injured? That's the way it should be. And much of the Western United States and these remote parts are like that. And I relish getting out into this. It's pure adventure, man. Pure adventure. A lot of people would look at where we are, this epic view, and they would do everything in their power to stay out of a place like this, to avoid it. That's why you don't see a ton of people out here, if any. Most people hate this place. They're scared of it. They think of it as a survival situation, which, it very well could be if you're not smart about things. You should be prepared. Another tenant of TMP. But man, is it epic. Is it special. Down here a ways, and I'll roll in footage, I just saw a raptor grab a snake and fly off with it. Couldn't tell what kind of bird it was. Maybe it was an eagle or a red-tailed hawk. Probably a red-tailed hawk. Big one. Carrying a big old snake. How cool is that? How often do you see that in person? Never. And that is the groundwork for what I'm going to review right now. It is the vehicle that has taken me to this place, a vehicle that I rely upon to take me to a place like this that won't strand me. And yes, it is a motorcycle. This will be the nut and fancy review of the outstanding, oh man, is this bike excellent, V Strom by Suzuki. Now, if you're not a subscriber, you just found this video by way of Google. By way of a link to another homepage, welcome. Glad to have you. I review all kinds of things. This will be my first motorcycle review, however. I'm gonna take a picture right there. That's sick looking. I may do more. My key and selected favorite motorcycles for certain philosophies of use. And the philosophy of use for this bike, as you can well see right now, is adventure bike. And this is truly an adventure bike. It is not a bike designed to go to, to Starbucks, to be seen at your local dealer, to show off to your friends, to make it look like that you get out in the desert. No, this bike serves its purpose in the Nut and Fancy Project, day in, day out, in places like this. I'm on a, about a 300 mile, pretty technical adventure bike ride today. We're talking canyons, paved roads, sharp twisties, Stuff like this, rocky desert roads, a little bit of technical hill climbing. I try to stay away from stuff like that on a big old bike like this. I recommend you do the same. And in the end, it'll be about 300 miles when I'm done. I'll roll in about midnight tonight. And it will be a memory that I will cherish for the rest of my life. And I'm so glad I'm able to take you along with it. And this is a bike that I trust to take me out in this environment. In this video, I don't know how long it's gonna go. I would, I would estimate about 50 minutes because I wanna talk about a lot of stuff. And I'm gonna give you the type of motorcycle review that I wish I could have found before I bought this bike for the project. I can't find it. The motorcycle reviews I see are five, 10 minutes long. They're very broad stroked and in my book, they're worthless. I hate them. I, I'm, I'm at the end of a review video go, I don't know anything about that bike. I know that guy's opinion. You know, but teach me. Teach, why is the bike cool? That's what I do with everything I review in TMP. That's why guys watch me. I'll lay a foundation of philosophy of how that item should be used. I'll talk about the pros and cons. 
I'll talk about value. I'll talk about durability. And yeah, we're going to do all that. Foundation for this bike, adventure bike. However, and by the way, this is a 2012, not the newer V-Strom. So if you're tuning in and go, man, I was really hoping for some information on the, the newer V-Strom. Let me get this out of the way. I like this generation better. I think it looks better. I like the cockpit area better. It has a lot more wind protection up front. It's plenty powerful for what I need it to do currently. It's extremely reliable. It is much better looking than the Beekstrom. I just, I just have a hard time warming up to it. I'm sure the bike is great. I'm glad Suzuki updated it. How they put down about 125 wheel horsepower on the new DL1000, uh, I'd be a lot more interested. I might be able to fix the wind protection issues. So this is the previous generation. This is a 12 and it will cover a lot of years. If you're in the market for a used bike, you might want to look for a used V-Strom. Even if the bike has 20,000 miles on it, if the guy has taken care of it, it'll go another 100,000. That's how good these darn Suzuki's are. They are amazing. It is a street bias motorcycle, not a dirt bias motorcycle. But don't tell Angus that. <laughs> That's right, his name is Angus. I finally named him. He thinks he's at home out here. He seems to do it just fine, day in and day out, through some pretty, pretty technical trails, actually. I've taken this thing up, well, I wouldn't say stuff like this. That's insane. I'm not that good of a rider, and I'm not that stupid either, to take a freaking 550-pound bike, 725 with all the gear on it, up a mountain like that. Uh-uh, I'll say that for my KTM, if I do it. No, it's, it's a street bias motorcycle. We'll start with the suspension, of which I'm not an expert. I'm not a suspension expert. And I'm not gonna to try to talk like other motorcycle reviewers. I'll just tell you as a user what I like and what I don't like. It is limited travel. And along the way, I'm gonna roll in weights, other information at the top of the screen, more specifics. You will bottom out in stuff like this. Big bumpy stuff, not really this. This is kind of nice. And I do it frequently. <laughs> I work my suspension on the V-Strom like a lot. So what? Would I like to have more suspension travel and technical dirt stuff? Absolutely. And the bike I will eventually get to replace Angus will be, any guesses? A KTM 1190. That bike is insane. And I also would trust the KTM out here. Hey, here comes a truck. I wonder if he's gonna stop and say, hey, you okay? We'll see. We'll see. He should. Every time you see someone pulled over out here, you should. The 1190 will replace this bike. But I have a lot of use left in this bike, and I'm really happy with it, even out in this stuff. So I just don't really see a pressing need to get rid of it. It's cost effective. It's cheap to run. Not really cheap to maintain if I bust something. But it's an excellent bike. The suspension does not bother me. No, it's not hugely adjustable up front. That's about all you got right here. It is in the back with this knob. But you know what, dudes? I like simple. I don't even know where I have this. Is it full? Yeah, it's full tight because I'm carrying some weight, like gas. I got some Rotax cans, gallon a piece right here. I like the suspension. It's medium soft right now. It's comfortable. It allows me to do the twisties just fine. That's about all I'm gonna say on it. The brakes are excellent on the V-Strom. This bike does not have ABS. That is a downside, according to me. I like to have ABS whenever I can get it. On any bike, do I need it? Mm, probably not. I've got about 8,500 miles on this bike right now, but I like it. The 1190 has ABS, it'll be an upgrade. So if you need ABS, this is not your bike. Might be a case for the new V-Strom. The wheels are street biased. They are cast magnesium wheels. They are good looking. They are standard Suzuki wheels, dudes. Which, which is to say, and this here, here comes a voice of experience. Let's see if this guy stops. I bet she does. Yeah, all good to go. Okay. I was telling my viewers that we're so far in here that everyone always stops to check on each other. Is that true or false? Well, pretty true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for stopping. See ya. Awesome. Told you. Everybody checks up each, on each other out here. We are remote. DNR truck. Good dude. 
I was talking about the wheels. Magnesium wheels can split and break on you, voice of experience. I hit one doing 60 out in the desert. Amazingly, I stayed on the bike and I destroyed the front rim. It cost me $500 to replace. That's the new one you're looking at. Yep. With the KTM wheel, you know, a dedicated dirt style wheel have done better. And I'm gonna roll in the footage when that happened. Uh, I don't know. It probably would have taken a Vulcan hit too. And in my opinion, a Vulcan hit is one where you hit something so hard, it is amazing you stay on the bike and something gets damaged or close to it or should have got damaged. <laughs> I call them Vulcan hits to take off from the Vulcan anti-aircraft gun system that used to be deployed. Air Force reference doesn't mean anything. Wheels, magnesium cast, they seem to work just fine as long as you're not going too fast out here. How about the motor? It is a V-twin and I love it. Suzuki motors are outstanding. I have lots of experience with Yamaha, Suzuki, KTM, and Honda. I have very limited experience with Kawasaki. I think the Japanese motors are all really good. They're durable as long as you maintain them the way they should. They'll last a long, long time. This one I think is putting out around 100 horse, 98 horse, something like that. It's not overly powerful. You're gonna see when I lift up the seat that I put a tuning box on it. We've done some modifications to this bike I have to make it more powerful and I'm really happy with how it ended up. So if you're running a V-Strom, you might consider that. It's cool. I like V-Twin uh, power, it's perfect out here. The gearing on the bike as it came from the factory was again biased for the street and so I changed it through a couple extra teeth on the back. I'm running a Super Sprox 42 tooth 42 tooth on the back, that's a stock chain. And now it does exactly what I want it to out here. So it's geared a little bit lower at about 80 miles an hour, which is a good fuel efficient, travel efficient cruise speed. I'm running about 4,700 RPM with a super sprock 42, uh, 42 tooth rear sprocket. And that's a composite one too. So it's aluminum center steel on the back. I like to steal out here because you can get rocks thrown up in your cogs and you can toast an aluminum uh, sprocket. Stock front is what I'm running. As it comes from the factory, this model, this was not an adventure model, did not have crash bars. You need crash bars if you're doing this kind of stuff. Sooner or later, you will lay it down. It's, it's inevitable, dudes. Anybody who's watching this video who's done real adventure biking will be nodding their head and they're like, yep, I laid mine down, I broke it. It just happens. I've never laid this down uh, like riding on the road, crashed it really, but at low speed, like coming under, you know, there's a valley, you think you have a good foot plant, you don't, the bike starts tipping. Uh, I've dumped it that way and that's where you see those scratches. And the crash bars save and have saved this entire fairing. Mandatory equipment right here, crash bars. And another benefit of having these is you can run what I consider to be probably the best, that's right, I said it, the best skid plate in the entire industry, and that is the Enduro Guardian. This is an aluminum skid plate, and you can see I give it a workout. Again, I don't have a ton of ground clearance in this street biased V-Strom DL1000. I don't have a ton of suspension travel, so you're gonna have to put on a good skid plate, dude. I have found within the last year that some of the best accessories for all motorcycles are not made by companies, large corporations. They're made by specific model enthusiasts. The dude that made this is a V-Strom fan. He was not happy with the skid plates that he saw out there and he's like, I want a skid plate I can jack the bike up on that can take log hits that will just last and last. And in my opinion, he achieved his goal. This thing is thick aluminum. It's tough. I have yet to break it. Downsides, I have to drop it to change the oil. And that sucks. Whatever happens. You can see the oil filter right there. Oil cooler right there. Now, the, another thing about the Enduro Guardian skid plate, and I may throw the websites up here as I go, is you can tie it into those Givy crash bars or in a wide variety of brands of cra um, crash bars. So you can see he has stainless steel bolts there. Make sure I'm showing you right. I've got inner tubes there to help isolate the shock. I kind of wish he had a better attachment method there because it is very time consuming to drop four bolts, realign them, 
put all the the shock isolation back on them. I don't like it. I like to have a, a quick attachment method there. But the good news is it works. It doesn't come loose. And then you can attach these. I'm kind of going into some aftermarket stuff right here. We'll talk along about the bike as we go. Those are the most excellent Enduro Guardian highway pegs. Do you need them? Uh, yeah, you totally need them. This bike does, again, you know, 400 mile day, which a lot of bikers, that isn't anything. I'm not saying that I'm all that. I ain't. A lot of dudes put a lot more miles on than I do. I just do my own thing. But to me, uh, you're able to change your leg position with the highway pegs. So instead of having it scrunched up for hundreds of miles, you can stretch your legs out like this. I'll show you footage somewhere along the way with me doing just that on GoPro. Oh, and is it awesome. And don't worry, if you lay the bike down, these will automatically fold. They're at an angle, so if it hits the ground, they're just going to do that. Yes, I've left them down and done some heavy cornering, and they'll just, you know, pop up again. You go, oh, I left my pegs down. No deal. I mean, no big deal. Big win on the Enduro skid plate. I just love Enduro Guardian. I think it's around $240. This is a fender extender. It comes from Twisted Throttle. I highly recommend it. And like most accessories I'm going to show you on this bike, it is not something I just put on on a whim. I didn't say, oh, that'd be cool to have. It's something I saw that the bike lacked. And I think most motorcycle dudes are that way. Some aren't. Some will just put accessories on their bikes to look cool, to make a statement. It's a hobby, whatever. Not me. Imagine that, TM Peers. I have to have it serve a specific purpose. And the purpose of this is to keep this clean. I went through some paint or some latex uh, caulking or something. It flipped all up on my skid plate and I had to scrape it off with a razor blade. It was like a half hour job to clean. And plus you get rocks flipped up in here, this stuff right here, up into your oil cooler, up into your radiator even, that high, bouncing all over there. A fender extender helps prevent that. It is anchored both by self-adhesive, um, the 3M double stick tape, and then the screws are what really holds it in. I think it's about $29, kind of pricey, worth it. One of the things, I might as well do it here since I'm kneeling down, that makes this bike capable for where we are, are these Heidenau K60 Scout tires. Damn, are these tires awesome. It seriously transformed this V-Strom. The stock tires it comes with uh, are good for the road. They absolutely suck for stuff like this. Their contact patches are entirely too large. They do not produce any traction in this stuff, or worse. The K60s, in my opinion, give little up on the road. They're still highly maneuverable. You have a much quicker turn in and roll in, as I call it. The bike just kind of wants to turn, lean in very quickly because the rounded ogive on the tire, I've adapted to that. But they provide great street traction. They wear great, and again, out on the real stuff, the adventure stuff, they are very sure-footed transform the bike i have about you're looking i would say 2,000 miles on this pair they are expensive they're made in germany and they are a bitch to get on uh we were trying to replace on that front tire when it got toasted we had the rim we tried to take it off ourselves i'm talking the high now k60 scout tires couldn't do it that may change in the future because i want to get my own tire changing apparatus with the motorcycles we're running yeah, but uh, really stiff walls, stiff bead. That's a good thing and uh, pretty durable. There's the rear tire. It's going to wear faster. Man, I love these tires. They are my top recommendation for a Strom. Maybe another adventure bike, the K60 Hidenhouse. They are expensive, like I said, though. How about these? We're back here. Might as well talk about it. The, the cans that come, I'm talking mufflers, the cans that come with your stock V-Strom are fine. I ran it for thousands of miles with that. The thing that I didn't like about them is they're just so heavy. And I put these on. These are whole shot, uh, you can see it, Dale Walker's whole shot cans. They are extremely light, they're durable, they look good, they're small in diameter. They also have the silencer screwed into the back of them. I really like them, but there are two things you need to be aware of. Number one, they sound like a damn cruiser bike. Uh, some of you guys watching this may love cruiser bikes. I'm not a cruiser dude. Uh, I, I have extensive experience in sport, super sport, dirt, adventure biking. That's what I do. I put it down about 20,000 miles a year, by the way, in case you're wondering. 
Last year, 20,000 miles between this bike and about eight others. Loaned, ones we owned, borrowed, rented. These are loud. Sounds like a cruiser pipe. It's kind of nice for when I film with you guys because you can tell what the engine is doing. You'll be able to hear it on GoPro, which is right there. Uh, a downside is I had to retune the bike. The ECU did not like these, and so I got the Dobeck tuning box. You'll see it under the seat here in a little bit, and I had to do some work with that. Once it's tuned and it's fueling correctly, you're going to have a faster V-Strom. It's going to be quicker in the upper RPM range with this. So the bike performs normal. When I get it up to, I don't know, 5,000 RPM higher, uh, it comes alive. And it's almost like a different bike. It, it hauls. It doesn't seem like it's only working with 100 horsepower. It seems like a lot more. Other modifications. Well, let's go back to stock configuration. The V-Strom this year did not come with heated grips. That sucks because this is a very big and also a tactical doodle. He has a DL650, a big winter bike for us. So in cold weather, we'll drive all the way down to when it's 35 degrees, maybe even colder. After that, I start losing motivation. <laughs> That's just me. I know a lot of motorcyclists that don't do that. In fact, most around here in this state won't. All the motorcycles are put away pretty much after October, it seems. Not me. I'm riding all year long. I had to put grip heaters on them. This was the Oxford grip heater. They were about 59 bucks, totally worth it. I'll show you how I wired everything later on. With the grip heaters, and here's a controller for it, I just put on the cowling. This is again why I like this model, because look at, I have some real estate to mount accessories and stuff that I need. There's a control box for it. Man, they really work good. They'll burn your hands if you're not careful. They do enlarge the diameter of the grip. You're gonna have to account for that. This is a cramp buster. Highly recommended. This is a CB-1 version. I like the narrow ones these days. And what you can do is just put your thumb on this for long drives and it prevents your hand going numb. So highly recommended. And then these are storm busters. Single attachment point variety. You will absolutely need these. Are ones like them if you come out in this stuff. Because if you don't, here comes a voice of experience, you're gonna dump your bike and you're gonna break a brake lever, a clutch lever, or in the case of last year, I dumped it on this side before I had the, the guards on it, and I had a wire come detached under here. It was a clutch wire of some sort. I couldn't start the bike. I couldn't figure it out. I didn't know what had happened. I ended up bump starting it going down a hill. I finally got it started. Good thing, because I was remote like I am here. I might be able to bump start it coming down here. But you're gonna need good traction on this big 1,000cc motor. I mean, if your tire's spinning coming down the hill, forget about it. You ain't bump start starting it. I'll show you some accessories I carry, just in case. I love these guards. They will twist on you if you give them a good whack. They just mount in the bar ends. They're cost effective, uh, and they give excellent wind protection. The Bark Buster Storms is what they're called, if I didn't say so. I mounted a 12 volt accessory outlet here. A lot of bikes come with this automatically, and I think all adventure bikes should have heated grips, 12 volt accessory outlet, among some other things I'm gonna mention. The V-Strom did not in this year, so I needed them, I added them. Another thing they didn't have, which sucks, is a gear indicator, or a voltmeter, and so I added those too. What you're looking at is called the Adventure Tech Auxiliary Panel. It's an aluminum shelf made out of 6061 T6 aluminum whose holes are milled to your spec website at the top. The guy is also a cool dude. He's also a V-Strommer. Yeah, so these cost I think around $50 plus $5 for each hole that you have him mill out for you. With this panel, several things are possible. One, I mounted the auxiliary lighting switch here. It used to be right here. Not a bad location, but in the winter time when it's cold, I also run something called Hippo Hands. They're like a big nylon cover for the handguard. The company has currently gone out of business. Bummer. I hope it resurrects. Here's a photo of the Hippo Hands. They are amazing. They look dumb, but man, are they practical and you are able to drive in that cold weather. Then if you get really cold, turn on your grip heaters. So now you have a gear indicator. Hey, I don't need that. Uh, I do. I like it. You know, I'm going around a sharp corner. What gear am I in? I thought I was in second. No, I'm in third. 
I come to a stoplight. Hey, I thought it was in second. I look at it. No, I'm still in fourth because I was distracted. Yeah, there's that desert wind I was talking about. GI Pro and all the heel tech stuff that I see is worth it. It is somewhat expensive. I think that is around 115 or so. Don't hold me to it. The voltmeter I got off eBay. I've covered it with a plastic accessory uh, sheet of plastic. Just hopefully make it more scratch proof, more waterproof. I like a voltmeter because it tells me how I'm drawing on my electrical system. You don't have a ton of excess amperage with the V-Strom. I found that I have enough to run my grips. I have enough to run my lights. I'll talk about those here in a sec. My radar detector, and I'm not in deficit, subject to change. That's though with 8,500 miles driven. I just put this panel in last week though, and I took it and threw on another voltmeter last fall as I was troubleshooting some stuff. And one of the things I was troubleshooting, I might as well tell you now, is I had a, some parasitic drain on it and the battery kept dying. I'll show you my solution for that. This is a TPX radar detector. I would give it a six out of 10. It is not awesome. It is one of the very few, if not the only dedicated waterproof motorcycle radar detectors. Well, nothing, what do you like about it? Um, I like, it is relatively small. It has a remote unit that's, uh, well, no, I think it's everything's just right here. This is just a power wire. I do have a remote LED wired on it. So that will go off bright when it's detecting something. Um, it just allowed me to get a ticket last year. <laughs> I was in the middle of nowhere and some jackass sheriff decided to ticket me at 80 miles an hour. Uh, yeah, I had an issue with it. I'm out in the middle of nowhere, dude. Seriously, you're gonna ride up? You know, if you're in a school zone or something, I can totally see it. This didn't go off soon enough. It just gave me like one flash. That's my issue. Also, the controls are kind of dicked in that it won't allow you to adjust the brightness of the LED or the brightness of the screen. I do like the concept. We need more motorcycle dedicated radar units. This is a GPS map 62 ST. I'm running it out in the wilderness. Usually I'm running my iPhone here in a four prong holder. This keeps track of where I am. It doesn't rely on a cell phone network. It's going to a certain location right now. I'm 14 miles away as the bird flies, probably around 25 as the road goes. It's being held in by ram mounts and these work great. So I have two mounting points. That's been enough for me. Wind protection. I told you on the newer V-Strom, I wasn't so digging this tiny little nose on it, and I will stick with that. I love the fairing on the old V-Stroms. I think it looks good. I think it's practical. It'll protect your upper portion here as you drive. Um, and it also is very adaptable to larger windscreens. This is an MRA. I think it's called a Vario windscreen. It's the tallest one they make, and it's in smoke color. It has thousands of miles on it at this point. It is being held by a MADSTAD bracket, which allows complete adjustability. I can tilt it back, I can extend it up and down. So if I go into really technical terrain, I'll lower my windscreen all the way down so I have a less chance of breaking it. Plus I'm leaning forward on the bike on a hill climb and I just won't damage it as easily. Love the windscreen. As the bike is configured with that windscreen and the Bark Buster Storm Guards, the wind protection is pretty excellent. Not like a sport tour where you get full knee protection. That ain't gonna happen. How about the controls on the V-Strom? Talking the stock configuration. I have no issues with them at all. I love it. I like that it's a regular old fashioned key start. I don't like push button electric, electronic starts. I think they're hokey. They're subject to problems, speaking from experience. I did 2000 miles on a Ducati Multistrada and a lot of times it wouldn't hook up. It wouldn't start. We had to dick around with it. You know, is it talking to the bike? You know, all those fancy electronics, man. They just scare me when I'm out here. You know, so what happens? You, you can't, your key fob won't talk to your bike out here? What the hell? Forget about it. One thing I didn't talk about is this, and I think an adventure bike should have it, and that's a temperature readout. You can see the ambient, it's 88 degrees. That is an aquarium thermometer I searched for and found on eBay. Like six bucks. And then I put a sheet of that, you know, iPhone screen plastic on it, and it makes it waterproof. I route the wire under the fairing, it comes out here somewhere. So it's getting a, a real feed, not interrupted by the engine or influenced by the engine. Yeah, I love it. I put them on all my bikes. On all the bikes we're running TMP, you'll see that same thermometer if the bike doesn't have a temp readout. Love the full turn signals on the V-Strom. I've never busted any off. They've been extremely reliable. I like full size turn signals, even on my dual sport bikes. That's another category I drive in a lot. Example, KTM 690, KTM 500, EXC. I like to be seen by motorists and I like not to die. 
These are the auxiliary lights that I finally put on last fall. Uh, and what, sorry for the wind, it is what it is. What prompted me to put these on is coming out of this location, this exact location last October. Yeah. And I came out about 11 o'clock at night and did about 150 miles through the desert with just the stock headlights, which I gotta say are decent. The V-Strom headlights are awesome. What you're looking at there though are a bulb improvement. That's a PIAA, PIA, 15224H4 Extreme, 4000 Kelvin bulb. You get about two of them for $50 on Amazon. I'm testing them, I just threw those in. We'll see how they do. There's my uh, fake Ferrari sticker, the Moose. Team Pierce always picked that up. The Denali lighting though is good. These are the D2 models. They are produced by Twisted Throttle. It's their proprietary adventure bike lighting. That is their brand of bracket too. And you can see how I've mounted it. Anytime you see me do a mod on my bike, I like it done totally excellent. So all the wiring's gonna be loomed. It's all gonna be zip tied. You can see all my work up here. I'm not gonna have dangling wires. It's gonna be waterproofed and it's gonna be soldered. Not just tapped in. I don't, I don't do that. Good bracket. All this will add weight to your front end. So it's firepower versus mobility. What this does for me is allows me to see immediately in front of the bike better for potholes, bumps, rocks, and then in traffic, it really allows you to be seen readily by motorists. Anytime I'm on the interstate, around a lot of cars at night, I'm running these. They are swappable. You can do a diffused uh, lens on them. That's what this one has. And then the clear one for maximum throw. I didn't really notice a big difference between the two. If I had to do it over again, I probably would have got the DX model of Den Denali lights, maybe a different kind for extra throw, but they're expensive. The lights alone are about $310, plus the bracket. Bikes are expensive, dude. To, to farkle your bike out to where it can do stuff like this to a level where you're happy with, you're gonna, be you're gonna spend a lot of money. Then if you lay it down and break something, you're gonna be spending more. There's a GoPro bracket. So on those videos we did in 2013, a lot of the footage you saw, like in the Grand Canyon, Arches National Park was filmed from that position right there with this V-Strong. Notice I, I don't thrash my bike, so you see it looks pretty nice. Normal wear and tear is good, abuse isn't. Abuse is where you just don't care and you just intentionally start scratching your bike up. That's not me. I keep it as nice as I possibly can with the conditions I'm riding in. I run the protective gear on it to keep it nice. This is an Alaskan Leathers sheepskin, and man is it excellent. I did try another seat on this. What was it? Ah, it's a Cortec or something, Corbin, Corbin seat, and I didn't like it. It had a really deep seat pocket, and so when I was coming out of the seat and leaning and steep turns in the canyons, it got in the way. I just didn't like it. The stock seat with the Alaskan Leathers on it, which is, as you can see, easily detached, is excellent. Uh, and I have thousands of miles on this. Basically, I got 8,000 miles on that pad right there. You can wash them with wool light, dry them out. Mine get dirty. And then we'll go to the aft of the bike. By the way, I love this. This is old school, man. Freaking attachment for your helmet. You can lock your helmet if you run an errand. A lot of the Japanese bikes had that, and now I just don't see it very often. Yeah, I've got boxes on this. We'll talk about that, but I just really like that. There's your rear pegs. And there's your stock pegs. Hey, nothing, I can't believe out here you haven't upgraded them. Well, the downside for the V-Strom is there's really not any deeper peg. That's one thing. And I find these are okay. I like the rubber mounts on them. Remember, the, the calling for this bike is not pure dirt. It's pure adventure. So today's ride is a good example. I'm gonna be about 60% mm, on stuff like this and about 40% highway interstate. And the stuff you've seen and will see in this video. So those pegs work great. Doodle, on the other hand, has upgraded, found some eBay pegs he threw on. They are sharp tooth, kind of uh, motocross style. They work good. Notice the piece of wood I have under there. I carry that wherever I go on the V-Strom, and actually all my bikes. They do make bigger feet for the kickstand on the V-Strom. Adventure Tech makes one. I may look into that. What amazes me about this bike, well, there's a lot of things, is one, it can take so much abuse. Change the oil, change the air filter. V-Strom keeps on going. I mean, I, what, what am I, 150 miles deep in the desert here from the direction I came? I, I'm just really not worried. If I was on a BMW, uh, I might be worried. I've had some friends with 1200 GSs that have broken down. I'm talking big breakdowns. 
stuff like this breaking out here? No. Once upon a time I ran a Shirai uh, lithium battery in this. It was excellent, it saved me about 11 pounds of weight, but I started having uh, depletion issues with it. I don't think it was the battery's fault, it's because I had a parasitic drain on it. I'll explain that here in a sec. Now I just have a, an AGM technology battery and it's been excellent, but I still like the sticker. <laughs> so I'm running it, it's cool. You know, you guys have been looking at the rack may have wondered what brand, it is Tortec. And talk about expensive, Tortec is expensive. Very expensive, but man is it good stuff. Least the stuff I've had. This is a powder coated steel frame and it can take abuse. I am constantly lashing stuff to it. Here's a photo of the 38 liter, liter Zega Pro bags that I frequently run on them. And that's what the rack is built for is the Zega Pro bags. I didn't run them today because I didn't need them. I'm not one of these guys that runs the bags just to look cool. If I don't need the bags, they come off. Streamline the bike, lighten the bike as much as possible. But those bags are excellent. Zega Pro, all the Tour Tech side bags are. There are some disadvantages. I've heard of guys breaking their legs when they go down because they had a fixed bag versus soft luggage in the back. That's an issue. I've never had that. I like the hard bags because they're easy to load, easy to unload. You can bring them into the hotel with you, bring them in the campsite with you. They're excellent. I put reflective in several locations on the bike in case you're wondering. Another benefit of the, Z of the Tour Tech luggage system is you have a steel bar coming around the backside of the V-Strom. So if someone runs into you, you have a little bit more protection for the bike, a little bit more. If you watched the show uh, Long Way Around with Ewan McGregor, he had the same frame on his 1200GS, got schwacked in Canada by that punk, and uh, it saved him, he says. He says because he had his Tour Tech stuff on. This is a top case, and here's a look at the stickers. GOA, you know it, patron member of the NRA, life member of GOA, by the way. Clint Eastwood, reared in steel. You guys should know what that is. U.S. Air Force retired, resists tyranny. There you go, quick sticker review. Couple here. I'm not one of these guys that slap stickers on all the places I, I went. I just don't do that. Instead, I want to show, you know, other messages. My personality. Hey, TMB, baby. Let's look in what I got here real quick. And I told you this would be about an hour long. Motorcycle guys will totally dig it. Uh, I have electronic GPS as you can see there, but I don't think it's smart to rely just upon that. I have a Utah uh, Recreation Atlas with me. This is a topographic atlas. It's really excellent. It'll show roads, topographic features, shortcuts. Uh, it's just really good. Look at that detail. It's only 20 bucks. Mine's pretty thrashed. They get, I don't know, wet. I got my built jacket today to layer up. Built's not a great brand, but it's affordable and it works. Right now I'm wearing a Clem Dakar jersey on top of my motor suit i'm going to do a separate protective gear video later on so stand by look how much stuff i'm cramming in this video man it's insane jumper cables what i'm going to show you bump start bump starting your motorcycle yeah good luck but that guy who come along a little while ago he could have given me a jump start right has some moisture in there because one of my water bottles leaks or it did i didn't have the lid on all the way happens Full-size screwdriver. This is in addition to my underseat tool, tool kit. This is great for popping rocks out of your sprockets. It has leverage as opposed to a folding screwdriver type from a Leatherman or a pocket knife. As much water as you can freaking carry. There's a Nalgene bottle I got. And this is just a quick review of some stuff I have. I have my Bivy, my SOL Bivy Escape Bad. That's awesome. It's also wet from the wetness. Survival equipment in here. I'm not gonna show you what it is right now. Extra clear visor, because I'm gonna be coming out at night. Warm weather gloves, there's a toe strap if I go over a place like that. I just talked to a dude that went off a place just like this. He's coming down, for whatever reason, not on a dirt road, he's on a paved road, but he comes down just like this, his bike ends up in a ravine, like, I don't know, 80 feet down, and it's a 700 pound adventure bike. How are you gonna get it out? You gonna drive it out? Here I would, I'd just come down here, but what if you're just in a ravine? That's what this is for. So if you come down, I mean, it's not 100 feet, but it's as long as I can make it. And I sewed this one myself because I snapped the aftermarket ones. They suck. Made my own. This one can take the weight of a V-Strom. You get a truck pulling, yeah. Hook up to the front fork. Yeah, you'll pull that bitch right out. No problems. This is uh, extra warm clothing. It's in a uh, bag. This is a giant loop bag for another uh, luggage system I have. And that's about it. Zega Pro top case. This is always, 
I repeat, always on the V-Strom. Running a top case to me is like having a good everyday carry system. You have your knife, you have your Swiss Army knife, your pistol, a flashlight, all the stuff we talk about. Top cases rock. It just gives so much capability to your motorcycle. This is one thing you gotta watch out for. This stainless steel cable always gets pinched with the Tortex. Now, we do have some experience with some other brands of top cases. This is the best we've seen so far. Uh, we have Givy and that other brand, I forget. These are Rotax uh, one gallon canisters right now, and that's how I strapped them. Hey, Nutton, why don't you put them on your top case? Because I want the weight as low as possible. So this is lighter than the extra passenger. It's on the back seat, area I'm not using. I just put them there. I'm gonna show you under the seats, the electronic mods and how I wired them in case uh, you have a V-Strom or heck, for that matter, any other motorcycle you'd want to wire. By the way, these Rotax canisters can take a beating and they don't leak. They are hard to get into and set up and get the fuel out of though, kind of a pain but I'll take it for how rugged they are. I have used some others, I love them. That'll give me about 80 miles of range. This bike will get, gets about, after the Dobek tuning box and the whole shot, 41 MPG is what I'm pulling out of this. If I drive it and mix driving the way I wanna drive it, which is to say I'm medium aggressive. I kinda get up on it, I'm just saying. You know, I'm not aggressive. Aggressive is a guy who does all these dumb risks and does, does stupid driving, but I'm a medium aggressive rider. Anytime there's traction, and that's a big caveat. If there's no traction, then I'm not that way. Oh yeah, this is a Gibby top case, T480. Uh, I really, really like it. it. Has a lot of use. Make sure you lubricate your zippers, by the way. There's my Lexan silverware. I have extra batteries for the GPS. There's an Endura 4 in green. Also, my Cadet is in here. Also, I have a PFI dude pink flashlight in here. Dedicated flashlight. All this should be in your top case. I'm actually looking for my, my lens cleaner. I know I have it. All my registration stuff is here. Center wrenches for my center headset if I'm driving with someone else. Lip stuff. Uh, come on, man. Is that it? The model number is PJ790. The Sony cam. I guess my top box is open. We'll take a quick look in here. Sunscreen. GPS spot messenger. That is the only way I can summon help where I'm at. I am well out of cell phone range. So this is it. I did a review on it once upon a time. They're a ripoff though. Spot charges way too much for their annual surface. They have poor service overall. I'm talking how they help you. They auto charge your credit card. So they kind of piss me off. I just use them because I don't have any way else to do it cost effectively. Electrolyte drink, highly recommended. Mixed in your water. It prevents me from getting headaches out here. Dudes, what do you know? The old Phoenix light, man. Still going strong. Man, I love this light. The P3D Phoenix in the headband. Still a winner. It's compact, lightweight. I have extra batteries for it. There's my glasses. There's my iPhone with extra battery. There's a Taser C2. The gun I'm carrying today in my top bag is going to be a kel PF9, no surprise, lightweight, capable, extra magazine. Love that gun. Is it the best subcompact pistol in the world? Nope, but it's lightweight and it works. There's a really cool way to charge your iPhone. Yeah, I know I got the outlet here, but uh, I like having a backup too because this iPhone is a critical life-saving device. I could climb up here or one of these mountains over there maybe, wherever I'm at, and maybe get cell phone service. That's the best way. Zip ties, electrical tape. These are long ones that will fit a lot of different things. I have various wires for the iPhone, another spare battery down there, uh, record report for mileage, Cine cable, all the stuff in my fanny pack, extra wipes, a little bit of first aid uh, stuff. There you go. That's a Gibby top, top bag. I should say tank bag. Uh, every bike I run has a tank bag. It's just mandatory. How else are you gonna get to your gun? You're gonna carry it in this? Under all this stuff? No, not practically. Wrapping it up, kind of. This is how you open the seat on the V-Strom, at least this year. Turn it, pop and lift. Pretty easy to do. Rocks right off. Some seats are a pain in the butt to do. I'll tell you what this is here in a bit. 
not the V-Strons. It comes off and goes back on really nice. Suzuki's such a great company. There's that AGM technology battery I'm running. And this, my friends, is my fuse box. Yep. It is a Blue Sea aquatic fuse box. It's meant for boats. And I went out on a search, my friends, till I found it. Found it in Amazon. Here's a photo. And was I stoked when I found it. It's the perfect size for the V-Strom. And I got rid of all the parasitic drain on my battery. Once upon a time, I had all these accessories, at least the lighting. That's a lighting switch for the Denali lights. I had them wired directly to my battery. I had like 15 things coming off. Not 15, but probably five each come out to try to start the bike. It's dead. Probably the LED light in the Denali switch is what I suspected. I'm not really sure. So by running this fuse box, what you do is you'll tap into your rear light relay. In other words, that's a 12 volt power that comes on only with the key. I tapped into that, soldered it. I didn't just tap into it, but I soldered it and I ran it to my fuse box. And I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail. And this is the relay. I actually ran it to the relay. So that 12 volt power lead comes to the relay, which comes from the battery. Long story short, when the key turns on, this will feed 12 volt power to all, everything that I've wired up. So that you can see I've labeled it real organized. The radar detector, grip heaters, Denali lights, all that comes on only with the keyed switch. These two wires are the voltmeter. They also will only come, the voltmeter will only come on through the relay. So as a review, I have, I found my 12 volt power lead here. And by the way, the instructions are all over the internet if you get lost. Wired into that, that goes to the relay. The relay feeds that battery power to the fuse box and all accessories are wired to the fuse box. Ta-da! Man, is it a good system. Everything is labeled, if not for you, for the next guy that buys your bike. Do him a favor. Like for instance, this is my power outlet. If you're under here, you didn't buy this bike, even me, I forget, hey, what was this? Oh, that goes to my radar detector. I use white electrical tape with a Sharpie. It'll withstand heat and it stays there forever. That's the under seat. Great system and it's a lot of work. I ain't gonna lie to you, a buttload of work. Any bike project takes forever to wire, takes a long time to design it and to um, thread the wires. In other words, to pull them through. I've lifted this tank, I can't tell you how many times, which by the way is necessary if you get to the air filter. And I'm running a K&N reusable, I just serviced it. That along with the Dobex um, tuning box and the whole shot mufflers give the performance, by the way. Forgot to say that. But when I, you know, pull these wire through, these wires through, they come through the looming you saw and it's pulled in such a way that it looks factory. I mean, you don't see any dangling wires in this bike, do you? Heck no. They're nice, there it is. There's a looming right there, see it? That's my looming coming through. And then I zip tie anchor it, label everything. That tuning box I'm telling you about is actually, where is it? I think it's back. Oh, there it is right here. You can hardly see it. See it under there? This is the Dobeck tuning box right there. And it's just a fueling box and it has instructions how you can tune it. I actually had a mechanic do the actual tuning for me after I installed it. He knew more about it than I did. There's my tool roll. And I believe in carrying a full toolkit. You've seen how that has come into play with a KTM crash. Look up that video. This is what I have in my toolkit. I bought all of this separate because I generally don't like Moto toolkits. They suck ass. Craftsman, multi-bit driver. This is dedicated sharp nose pliers, vice grips. This size exactly because it's light and it can still take a big bolt. Snips, the most compact lightweight end wrenches I can find. Smaller zip ties, closed in end wrenches, size for your bike an extension for the quarter inch driver set that I carry, more zip ties of every sort and description. In here you'll find hex, I hope you guys like this, it's a lot of work. Uh, hex wrenches, metric variety, size of the bike, electrical tape, wire, gorilla duct tape, and then here I've got more hex wrenches sized for the bike. That can get you out of a bind. And then here's my dedicated quarter inch driver set, bought from AutoZone for I think like 10 bucks and it works fine. I think it's even forged. Made in China, but it works great. And then I rubber band it uh, closed, otherwise the whole thing's gonna open up on you and dump everything. You saw the extension side to it. With those tools and the uh, screwdriver you saw, 
I can fix most things on this bike out here. I cannot, however, fix the tire. I do have a tire change kit in there. I forgot to show you that. But I can't take it off the rim. I told you that. This bike does not have a center stand. I wish it did. Yes, there are some out there. The only reason I haven't put it on is because I don't want a lower ground clearance out here. And I don't want the weight and expense. So I put it off for now. Whew. A lot to talk about, dudes. Let me look at my note page. I think I've covered most things on the V-Strom. The acceleration on the bike is kicking. Uh, it, most, I just say this because I'm funny. I'll come off a ride like this out in the desert and then I'll go up against a Subaru STI and I like wasting the guy. I know, I just like it. I, I told you I'm a medium aggressive driver. I like, I like doing a little bit of impromptu racing. Yeah, whatever. Talked about the Super Sprocks already, tank bag, grip heater, fender extender, crash bars, Manstad screen mount, Bark Buster Storm, yeah. Oh, I forgot this. This does have an Adventure Tech fork brace on it, and man, is that awesome. Tactical Doodle is the one that sold me on that. That's my son. He ran it on his DL650. He's like, you got to try it. It improves the bike a thousand percent, all right, hundred percent in side winds. The V-Strom is not a super heavy bike in a strong crosswind. I'll roll in footage somewhere. It would wander. I mean, you kind of really get a big lean in it with a fork brace on. It's much more planted, more stable. It also helps in cornering. I like it. I did, however, lose my zip up seal savers, which were so excellent. I loved having those and I can't run them now because they have to come down here. That's a fork brace by Adventure Tech. I think it's on sale now for $59 when I'm filming this video. Yeah, what a good looking bike. I love the red. My favorite bike colors are red, yellow, white, maybe black, but I really like high visibility colors. Um, for safety on the road and they look good. The paint on this has worn very well. The fasteners on the Suzuki have done well. Some are zinc plated, they will rust on you, gotta be careful. Durability on the bike has been so far outstanding. I don't think you can go wrong with a V-Strom. The question you need to ask yourself is how many of these accessories would you need to do what you're gonna do on the bike? If you're not coming out here, if you're just running to school on it, commuting on it on the roads, you don't need all this stuff, you don't. Like I said, I put all this stuff on because how I use the bike. The philosophy of use for my V-Strom is an adventure bike. Not pretend adventure bike, but real adventure bike. Battery died on the camera. So welcome to yet another awkward transition in my videos. Standard. I think I was wrapping it up though. Telling you that overall, I love this generation of V-Strom DL1000. Is it the perfect bike? No, no bike is perfect. You're gonna to have to decide how much money you're willing to spend first and foremost. But this is a bike that for its very modest purchase price, by the way, extreme value on the V-Stroms, even the new ones I think off the Sherman floor are like 10.5, something like that. You're gonna get a bike that can do everything to a very good to excellent level, including this stuff. Now, it doesn't like this washboard with a suspension. I mean, it will jar your fillings out. It's a street bias bike. I've made that clear in this review. But it's still very good on this stuff. If it wasn't, I would have gotten rid of it by now. I've had it for over a year, 8,500 miles in that year. Trust me, my viewers know. If it sucks, I get rid of it. The V-Strom is still here. That should say something. By the way, Mrs. Nothing Fancy likes this bike too. She doesn't like the cruiser sound coming out of those whole shot mufflers. She hates that. <laughs> Just telling you. She loves the pillion. It's very comfortable and with a top box, she can rest against it. Has a great seat on it. The pegs are good. She doesn't cramp up. So she's got to watch her riding position. Otherwise, she's going to be in pain. There's some more of the reflective you see on that. Saves gas, hauls ass. The DL1000. Oh, I might want to need get those keys. I went ahead and put the cans back on, seat back on, reassembled it. Highly recommended. If you find a used one this generation, I would get it. Decide what's most important to you. But like I said, it's a bike that can do pretty much everything well. I've owned sport bikes in the canyons with this. Yes. But not fancy. I'm a really good sport biker. I know. I'm just telling you what's happened, dude. It corners like a banshee, this V-Strom. That's a nothing fancy review out in the middle of nowhere. Seriously, nowhere. And I've got the funnest part of the day ahead of me. That's the helmet I wrecked in, by the way. I know, haven't replaced it yet. Maybe one of these days. And that funnest part is driving more of this. 
this epic scenery, watching pronghorn antelope, eagles, deer, birds singing on cue. Hear them? All of that on a bike like this. I hope you get out and adventure. I hope you motorcycle, do it safely, wear all the gear all the time. This is Nothing Fancy signing off. See ya.